<laughs> Hello, and welcome to the Folger Genetics Q3 2023 uh, Earnings Conference Call webcast. If anyone should require operator assistance, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. You may be placed into question queue at any time by pressing star one on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It's now my pleasure to turn the call over to Melanie Solomon, Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thanks, Kevin. Good morning, and welcome to the Fulgent Third Quarter 2023 Financial Results Conference Call. On the call today are Ming Shea, Chief Executive Officer, Paul Kim, Chief Financial Officer, and Brandon Perth Hughes, Chief Commercial Officer. The company's press release discussing the financial results is available on the Investor Relations section of the company's website, www.fulgent.com. The replay of this call will be available shortly after the call concludes on the Investor Relations section of the company's website. Management's prepared remarks and answers to your questions on today's call will contain forward-looking statements. These forward-looking statements represent management's estimates based on current views and assumptions, which may prove to be incorrect. As a result, matters discussed in any forward-looking statements are subject to risks, uncertainties, and changes in circumstances that may cause actual results to differ for those described in the forward-looking statements. The company assumes no obligation to update any of the forward-looking statements it may make today to reflect actual results or changes in expectations. Listeners should not rely on any forward-looking statements as predictions of future events and should listen to management's remarks today with the understanding that actual events, including the company's actual future results, may be materially different in what is described in or implied by these forward-looking statements. Please review the more detailed discussions related to these forward-looking statements, including the discussions of some of the risk factors that may cause results to differ from those described in these forward-looking statements contained in the company's filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, including the previously filed 10-K for the year ended December 31, 2022, and subsequently filed reports which are available on the company's investor relations website. Management's prepared remarks, including discussions of earnings and earnings per share, contain financial measures not prepared in accordance with accounting principles generally accepted in the United States or GAAP. Management has presented these non-GAAP financial measures because it believes they may be useful to investors for various reasons, but they should not be viewed as a substitute for or superior to the company's financial results prepared in accordance with GAAP. Please see the company's press release discussing its financial results for the third quarter of 2023 for more information, including the description of how the company calculates non-GAAP income or loss, earnings or loss per share, and adjusted EBITDA, and a reconciliation of these financial measures to income or loss and earnings or loss per share, the most directly comparable GAAP financial measures. With that, I'd now like to turn the call over to Ming. Thank you, Melanie. Good morning, and thank you for joining our call today. I will start with some comments on the quarter. Then Brandon will review our gold products and go-to-market update from the third quarter. And Paul will conclude with the financials and the outlook before we take your questions. We are pleased with our results in the third quarter with $85 million of total revenue due to our successful collection effort we recognize additional $90 million of revenue from previously built COVID-19 tests. Our core revenue of $66 million was driven by momentum in precision diagnostic, as we expected. The revenue for the anatomic pathology were seasonally lower in the third quarter. Farmer service which we had said is a lumpy business, decreased in the third quarter was as we anticipated. Given these results, we are pleased to affirm our guidance for the full year of $260 million of core revenue. We continue to make good progress with our development Jim Farmer, our no novel nano encapsulation technology include over 40 patents and a target therapy platform designed to improve the therapeutic windows and the pharmacokinetics profile of both new and existing cancer drugs. Our lead drug candidate, FID007, has shown promised results for the treatment of numerous cancers, including head, neck, ampullary, and pancreatic, with reduced side effects. 
This weekend, we'll present additional data, including all ongoing studies of FID-07 at the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer, annual meeting ongoing on now in San Diego. We'll then have the post available on our website. From this data, we are moving forward with phase two studies in head and neck cancer. We have submitted our phase two clinical protocol to FDA and expect the initial study in the first quarter of 2024. We are excited about reaching this next milestones for pharma and bringing FID-07 to more patients in clinical settings. I'd like to thank our employees and the shareholders for your loyalty during the past quarter. We're looking forward to close out a strong year and capitalize on the momentum what we see ahead. I will now turn over the call to, over to Brandon, our Chief Commissioner Officer, to talk about our diagnosis business results during the quarter. Brandon? <clears throat> thank you, Ming. We had yet another solid quarter, led by continued momentum in our precision diagnostics division. Core revenue for the third quarter totaled $66 million, down 2% sequentially and up 17% year over year. Breaking it down further, precision diagnostics came in at $37.5 million, an increase of 16% sequentially and 45% year over year. As we have mentioned in previous calls, because of the nature of the contracts and awards, our pharma services business will be lumpy. This was the case for the third quarter. Pharma services came in at $3.7 million, down 50% sequentially and up 19% year over year. That said, our pharma services pipeline looks strong with new partnerships coming online. In addition, our capabilities today are broader than ever before, giving our clients the opportunity to work with a multidisciplinary team experienced in pathology, multiomics, oncology, spatial transcriptomics, liquid biopsy, single cell sequencing, proteomics, and more. We are confident that the pharma services will be an integral part of our success going forward. Our beacon carrier screening portfolio of tests continues to be a significant growth driver for precision <coughs> diagnostics. As a reminder, carrier screening assesses risk of passing on certain genetic conditions to children. This test is for anyone who is currently pregnant, considering pregnancy, or planning to become pregnant in the future. Our beacon test menu now includes seven preset panels ranging from six to 787 genes. However, we have the ability to customize panels for our clients, which is something not widely available in the market. This is proving to be an important differentiator. Turnaround time has been stable and is now one of the fastest in the industry with a mean turnaround time of 12 days. The focus now is to continue to gain market share in the infertility space and begin initial planning for a rollout to the OB market. During the third quarter, we entered into a new agreement with Progeny for beacon care screening. Progeny is a leading benefits management company specializing in fertility and family building solutions. This new agreement allows us to provide reproductive genetic testing to the Progeny member network. This is an important agreement for Fulgent since many of our reproductive clients see Progeny patients. Along with our robust managed care contracts, this new agreement puts Fulgent in a strong position for coverage and reimbursement. An area of focus for R&D during the quarter was to update our hereditary cancer panels. As the field continues to generate more and more data, we need to continually look at what we're offering to make sure our panels are as clinically relevant for patients and providers as possible. In making these updates, our team focused on giving well-defined options to providers. Our focus panels are now closely aligned with the latest NCCN guidelines, and genes included on these panels are high to moderate risk factors for cancer, as noted in the guidelines, and associated with direct actionability. The comprehensive panels are broader and include the focus genes as well as low-risk genes and candidate genes that may provide information about the cause of the cancer in the family, but may not be associated with actionable guidelines at this time. 
Our comprehensive offerings for hereditary cancer testing, coupled with our test menu for solid tumors and hematological malignancies, makes us an attractive choice for clinicians. We are often asked about further M&A or strategic investment opportunities. This is an area we spend a lot of time on, consistently evaluating companies and technologies. However, we are being highly selective. We are seeing the investments we have made in our business pay off with meaningful organic growth and continuing strengthening of our position in the market. While there are likely opportunities for us to strengthen through M&A, we will continue to be measured in our approach. I'll now turn the call over to our CFO, Paul Kim, to walk through the detailed financials for the third quarter. Paul? Thanks, Brandon. Revenue in the third quarter totaled $85 million compared to $106 million in the third quarter of 2022. Approximately $19 million came from COVID-19 testing in Q3, which was not part of our guidance. Revenue from our core business totaled $66 million, which exceeded our guidance of $65 million and grew 17% year-over-year. Year. Gross margin was 47%. The increase in gross margin year-over-year is primarily related to COVID-19 revenues of $19 million. Recognized on previously billed tests due to successful insurance collection on appeals. Now turning to operating expenses. Total gap operating expenses were $39.6 million for the third quarter, down from $40.4 million in the second quarter of 2023. Non-gap operating expenses totaled $29.4 million, down from $30.4 million in the second quarter of 2023. Non-GAAP operating margin increased 27 percentage points sequentially to 15.4%, primarily due to COVID-19 testing revenue recognized in the quarter. We recognized a tax expense of $20 million in the third quarter as we put up a reserve against our deferred tax assets. But due to being in a loss position, we reserve for these deferred tax assets in full. With our performance and gross margins and operating margins in the third quarter, had we used the previous statutory rate instead of booking the valuation allowance, we would have further exceeded our projections. Adjusted EBITDA for the third quarter was $18.1 million compared to $19.7 million in the third quarter of 2022. On a non-GAAP basis and excluding equity-based compensation expense of intangible asset amortization, loss for the quarter was $17.7 I'm sorry, $11.7 million, or $0.39 cents per share, based on $30 million weighted average shares outstanding. Turning to the balance sheet, we ended a third quarter with approximately $851 million in cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities. Cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities increased $4 million from Q2, of which $3 million was an increase in investments. We were active with our share repurchase program in the third quarter. We repurchased approximately 80,000 shares of our common stock at an aggregate cost of $2.2 million at an average price of $27.65 under the stock repurchase program announced in March of 2022. Subsequent to the end of the quarter, as of October 31st, we have since repurchased approximately 533,000 shares at an aggregated cost of $13.7 million. As of October 31st, 2023, a total of approximately $159 million remained available for future repurchases of our common stock under the stock repurchase program. Moving on to our outlook for 2023, we're reiterating core revenue guidance of $260 million. This number does not include additional revenues from COVID-19 testing. Excluding the $19 million of COVID-19 revenues, the non-GAAP gross margins improved two percentage points in Q3 to 36%, and we estimate Q4 non-GAAP gross margins to remain relatively the same or slightly higher. We expect that our ongoing integration efforts with our recent acquisitions will create efficiencies that will result in improved gross margins and operating margins in 2024. For the full year 2023, utilizing a non-GAAP tax provision, 
an average share count of 30 million. We maintain net non-GAAP loss of 95 cents per share for our shareholders, excluding stock-based compensation and amortization of intangible assets, as well as any one-time charges. Given our strong balance sheet and cash position and the way we've been balancing our investments, we wanted to provide guidance on our expected cash position at the close of the year. Our investments in our therapeutics business have been lower than anticipated this year, and we continue to be active with our share repurchase program. Our core business is performing well, and we had some welcome through unexpected COVID-19 testing revenues. As such, excluding any stock repurchases since Q3 or other expenditures outside the ordinary course, we expect to end the year with approximately $830 million of cash, cash equivalents, and investments. Overall, we have strengthened our core business, bolstered our portfolio through strategic acquisitions, and improved our financial performance in 2023. We're pleased with our trajectory and see good momentum ahead. Thank you for joining our call today. Operator, now you may open it up for questions. Certainly. We'll now be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to be placed in the question queue, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Our first question today is coming from David Westenberg from Piper Sandler. Your line is now live. Hi. Um, thank you for taking the question, and um, congrats on, on on the strong work here. Um so um, let, let, can you talk about um, any of the, um, the, the, the COVID reimbursement payment? Um, I mean, I, I think you guys have mostly exited COVID. I mean, or, or is there any um, COVID testing uh, remaining, or a, how, how should we think about that as, as an option from here out? Yeah, Brandon, you want to take the question? Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Dave. Um, there's very little ongoing COVID testing. That, that is accurate. Um, however, you know, we continue to appeal claims and continue to collect on AR uh, from when COVID, COVID testing was much higher. So I think that's what you're seeing today. I think you're seeing the, the payoff of a robust revenue cycle management team and the payoff of a company that, you know, is going to do all we can to collect on the work that we've done. So it was uh, essentially, you know, a collections effort and uh, proud of the team to, you know, that have done a good job to collect on the tests that we ran during the spike of COVID. David, uh, at the beginning of the year, at the, at the beginning of the year, we stripped out COVID from our uh, core guidance and from an operational perspective. And when we did that, we commented the assumptions that we made um, in not including that we felt was uh, conservative. So, uh, you know, these kinds of adjustments that you're seeing are, you know, um, we're pleased to report that they're on the positive side. And I think the other thing that it points to is our overall efficiencies in the way that we're conducting our business, whether it be appeals or the way that we're running the operations. So, you know, uh, we certainly are pleased with the uplift that we're getting from COVID, but we're going to continue to, you know, not have that uh, within our uh, guidance. Yep. No, I, I I appreciate the conservatism on on, on not having in the gui- uh, in the guidance, but I would ask um is, is there any p- potential for for any one more time payment? And I realize like on a go forward basis, I mean this isn't necessarily how we all are going to value the company, but just for 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 mechanical purposes, um more. Yeah, there is. Uh, our our collection efforts are ongoing. Our appeals efforts are ongoing. So. Is there a chance we have additional collections from COVID-19 in Q4 and beyond? Yes. Is something we're counting on? No. But, yeah, I mean, we're continuing to do work on those appeals and on those collections. Yes. Okay, great. And then um, how, you know, you, you, you mentioned, um, you know, the pharma revenue being a little bit lumpy. Um, you know, just overall in, 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 uh, across the industry, we are seeing pharma taking a little bit more of a conservative approach with, with their spending. You know, h- how confident are you in, in, in is this is, is lumps and, you know, maybe not just kind of weakening macro uh, overall? Because, you know, we, there is, you know, uh, you know across, across the industry, we are seeing some of that weakening macro. Yeah, you know, I think we're starting with a little bit smaller number, perhaps. So I, I don't think what we're seeing is a, a macro environment change. Um, you know, I think you know, we have, you know, we don't yet have a large, you know, client base for these services. It's something we're building out. So I think 
what Fulgent needs to do is continue to get more clients, needs to continue to get more market share, and needs to continue to get out to our existing clients to sell the new services we've launched in that division. So I think for us, it's just um, sort of a timing thing. Um, the pipeline does look strong. Uh, we, we are onboarding new partnerships and new clients. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think we're seeing that macro shift. I think for us it's just a timing um, and ultimately – to have a uh, more steady trajectory, uh, we need to continue to fill that sales funnel, need to continue to onboard new partnerships, and continue to get those clients to take advantage of all the new products and services we've launched. David, uh, Brandon and I have been commenting on pharma services and the nature of that uh, business being lumpy, as uh, Brandon mentioned. The other thing is the sales cycle um, is longer in terms of duration. But if you kind of take a step back and look at um, the overall performance of pharma services, um, we did approximately $10 million in 2022. And in 2023, even with the lumpiness, we're uh, anticipated within our guidance to do approximately $21, $22 million. So, you know, we're uh, anticipated to have over 100% increase in that business. We anticipated um, the pharma services revenues to be lower in Q3 and Q4. Uh, you know, uh, anticipating, you know, when the work, um, um, you know, will be serviced and recognizable in terms of revenues. But as Brandon indicated, um, you know, we are really excited about this business and our funnel is full. Got it. Great. I'll, I'll, do that. I'll just ask uh, one more and, 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 and let Andrew uh, have some more questions. Um, so just um, I, I know you're going to uh, begin phase two, I think, early next year. So, uh, I know you're not giving 2024 guidance, but I, I, I would be uh, I would love to hear about you know maybe anticipated spend on on you know maybe some of these some of that, that or that project specifically um, if there is a, a major increase in in R and D spend um, associated with that um, uh, as a step up. Thank you. Yes, uh, David. Uh, I think the uh, our uh, the budget. Uh, uh, projection still solid. Uh, we are still around the $15 million uh, uh, annual, annually burn rate. So for the phase two study, uh, it's going to be the phase two uh, study at the second line of therapy for the head and neck cancer <coughs> patient. So uh, it is a combi- combining combinational therapy, which is with the uh, suggested by the, the the experts in the in this field, uh, we feel the very good about this uh, our position and the market potential potential. But in terms of R and D spending, the fifty million dollars we allocated is not only uh, only for the clinical trials, but the, all the new drug development effort uh, combined together. So we still expect about the fifty million dollars annual burn rate. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next question today is coming from Andrew Cooper from Raymond James. Your line is now live. Sorry, I had myself muted. Thank you for the uh, the questions. Um, I guess just you know want to maybe first ask a little bit about the the guidance, just the sequential revenue. Um, you know, the core being sort of flattish, maybe down a touch is sort of what you're pointing to. So. Maybe just a sense for how much of that might be seasonality in your minds versus um, maybe something that uh, that is moving a little bit more materially from quarter to quarter. Uh, hey, thanks for the question, Andrew. Um, no, it certainly is some seasonality in it, um, especially as it relates to our anatomic pathology division. Uh, that's something we are planning on. Uh, in addition, it, it still goes back to some of our pharma services um, and needing to, you know, get those projects through the door, get them signed out so we can book those revenues. So that's that's another thing we're planning on in, in Q4, just seeing some additional lumpiness in the uh, in the pharma services business. But you know, the precision diagnostics. You know, still has tremendous momentum. Uh, Beacon volumes are doing incredibly well. Our oncology business is doing well. Um, so we expect to see that continue momentum uh, into the fourth, fourth quarter. Uh, but again, taking a you know a bit of a conservative approach, you know, as it relates to some of the seasonality around AP and some of the pharma services. Okay, helpful. And, and a couple of those are, are areas I wanted to hit on as well. So maybe starting with with AP. Um, if I have my numbers right for precision diagnostics and, and uh, pharma services for this quarter, I think AP was a little bit lower than 
we were looking for and, and I think lower than you were sort of looking for, at least at the start of the year when you originally guided for that segment. So sort of what's going on there? Can you give us a little bit of an update in, in AP um, and how we should be thinking about that business, given uh, it is a pretty, pretty hefty chunk of the overall, uh, but not the one that we've talked about much today? Yeah, certainly. No, it is. And, you know, we're still continuing to sort of fulgent fi that acquisition and, and, and doing the work there to uh, implement our technologies, you know, our procedures. And the focus has been improving the operation um, and improving those margins. I think we're making some good process there, good progress there, but perhaps taking a little bit, you know, longer than, than we anticipated to work through that acquisition. But, you know, things are generally trending in the right direction. You know, there it's a pretty stable business. You're right. Um, you know, so the the little bit of a downtrend that we saw, you know, could be a little bit of seasonality into the back half of the year. Um, you know, we are monitoring our accounts for profitability. So, to a very small degree, we've exited some areas where maybe we didn't have favorable reimbursement or. For whatever reason, the, the the mix wasn't you know a profitable uh, account for us. So we are looking into some account level profitability um, that may play a small role in it. But you know, long term, you know, we're continuing to invest in that business. Um, we've made some changes into the go to market strategy and sales structure. We are onboarding some additional salespeople in the back half of this year and early next year. Uh, we believe we have uh, you know an incredible product offering in AP. Uh, our subspecialty trained pathologists are some of the best in the United States. Turnaround times are fantastic. So we do believe it's an, an area we can grow. Um, and hopefully some of the investments we've made recently or continuing to invest will pay off into next year. Okay, great. That, that's helpful. Um, and then just on Fulgent Oncology, I know last quarter we talked about, you know, adding some incremental heads, starting to, to build that rollout beyond the West Coast where you initially started. So would love just an update on sort of how that's going, what the reception has been, maybe where you are in some of those hiring processes that I know don't uh, don't happen overnight. They, yeah, thank you. They certainly don't happen overnight. And uh, as you've seen, we are quite selective with who we onboard into the sales team. Um, we have brought on two new uh, headcounts. Um, they're not on the West Coast. They're uh, in different other, other territories. So that geographical expansion we talked about is happening. Um, you know, there's a, obviously a, a ramp period for these uh, new reps. Uh, they don't step in selling on day one, even though they would love to. Um, but the reps that we've brought on board are industry veterans. They're industry experts. So they do bring with them, you know, that client-level expertise and market expertise. So we are enthusiastic about their potential long-term to drive new sales for Fulgen Oncology. And we're continuing to look for additional sales talent. So, But, again, it's sort of a, more of an opportunistic thing when we find the right people in the right territories. Uh, we don't have a ton of, quote, open positions right now that we're just trying to fill. Um, so we'll continue to do that. Uh, the product offering um, is going well. Uh, I think we've done a good job with that rollout. So it's something that's a, a long-term vision for the company, and we'll continue to layer on uh, capabilities and salespeople as we move forward. Okay, that's helpful. And then maybe just one on, on Beacon as well, you know, Pretty big immediate step up early in the year in terms of the the volumes and the share gains there. So just would love any any commentary on sort of whether that's stabilized or you continuing to take share in that IVF setting. Um, and then what are some of the guideposts we should really be looking for as we think about that build out and that initial effort to uh, to make the transition into the OBGYN setting as well. Well, as we've discussed before, I mean, there was massive disruption in that space, right? So clients um, were left without a provider on short notice. So those clients had to find a new lab uh, relatively quickly. So um, it was certainly hectic there for a while for the clients as well as for Fulgen and other laboratories. But most of that business had to find a new home, uh, and it did. And I've, like as you said, Fulgen benefited tremendously from that. I think what we're seeing now is some of those clients were a bit rushed in their decision-making process and perhaps not entirely pleased with some of the laboratories they've chosen for a variety of reasons, whether it's panel content, turnaround time, you know, customer service. So, so now what we're seeing is, you know, the clients have had a time to digest everything, um, now seeing that Fulgent may have been a better choice. So while, the, like you said, the mad dash kind of happened, now it's more of a grind to, you know, find the clients, 
um, where Fulgic can be a better service provider than, than what they're currently getting. In terms of the OB space, you know, it's something we have, it's a bright spot on our radar. It's a, a huge uh, town. It's a big opportunity for us. Um, you know, we've commented historically that often NIPT and carrier screening are coupled together. That, that's true, but I think what we're seeing right now with the dynamics and carrier screening, um, I do believe that there is a, a subset of that market that would be willing to separate the two. I think with our turnaround time, which is, again, right now around 12 days, we're signing some of these out as fast as nine days. I think the OB and the infertility uh, clinics appreciate that turnaround time. Our ability to customize these panels from anywhere between a handful of genes all the way up to almost 800. So I think we've done a phenomenal job going to market with Beacon. Uh, and even in lieu of NIPT, I think we can get the attention of some of these OB doctors with Beacon. And Andrew, the numbers, they back that up, meaning that uh, earlier Brandon talked about some of our assumptions in anatomic pathology and that being relatively muted. But if you take a look at uh, the performance that we had in precision diagnostics, which is the most lucrative part of the market, and um, it's the uh, area that we believe that we shine in terms of our capabilities and services. In Q1, the revenues for precision diagnostics, it was a little under $29 million. In Q2, it was between 32 and $33 million. And in this quarter, it's between 37 and 38 million. So, you know, in terms of the growth rate and the acceleration and the performance that we've been having in this particular uh, sector, within a very short time frame, it's been really impactful on the company. No, that's that's helpful, and certainly appreciate that uh, that growth growth profile there. Maybe just one more for me, kind of higher level. Um, you know, when we think about the FDA. LDT regulations, I think, you know, we'll see whether they go in, how they're written or not. But how do you think about that and what that means to some of the pitch that you make? Obviously, the turnaround time piece isn't affected, but that ability to customize under sort of a tweaked uh, or, or really overhauled LDT regime, how do we think about what that might mean and sort of what's the, the plan to the degree that this does go in as written um, because those customizations presumably become a, a, at least more difficult. Um, so just would love kind of your thoughts on, one, the regulation in general, and, and two, how that specifically plays in for, for Fulgent and the strategy you guys take, especially with Beacon. I mean, it's a good question. We're monitoring it as closely as every other lab out there, right? I mean, this um, they've been exercising jurisdictional discretion for, for many years, um, have leaned on LDTs uh, with CAP and CLIA validation. So, like, there's something like 22,000 genetic tests on the Fulgent test menu. We're not sure how the FDA will approach regulating 22,000 tests per lab, for example. Um, you know, we think they're going to target some of the higher risk genetic testing, some of the higher volume <coughs> genetic testing. But, you know, look, it's hard to say, it's hard to predict. Uh, however it shakes out, we'll be prepared, right? We have the subject matter expertise. We have the operational expertise. So it's something we're watching and waiting. I think it is a, a, a quite a um, difficult task um, to step in and, and try to do this after all these years and, and all these genetic testing. Um, but again, it's, you know, we will watch it, we will monitor it, and we will respond, you know, accordingly with the expertise we have here in that area. Um, Larry, you have uh, some additional feedback on the FDA? Yeah, you know, our quality systems are in place and a, a, a very, a very, uh, um, very professional. So whatever the FDA throws at us, uh, we feel that we can respond in a timely fashion. Agreed. Andrew, it sounds like you have some connectivity issues. I just, I just said I would uh, would stop there. Hopefully you can hear me okay. now. Apologies. Yes, we can. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. We reached the end of our question and answer session. And ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude today's teleconference and webcast. You may disconnect your lines at this time and have a wonderful day. We thank you for your participation today.